Summer reading lists are a trick used by teachers to get kids to do homework even when school is out. Uh, as if forcing you to read and overanalyze stuff isn't bad enough for nine months out of the year. Yeah, these books are important or classic, but they really just make your eyes melt out of your head from sheer boredom. Fortunately, this is my channel and I don't waste time with those books. Reading should be fun, inspiring, a healthy form of escapism. Good books are cheaper than drugs and a lot better for you too. Even when times were tough and I was flat broke, I could still scrape together a few bucks for a paperback and that would give me hours of good entertainment. This was especially true in the summer of 2008 when I spent my off-duty hours with my friends Shane and Eli, eating 4,000 calories a day and lifting weights like we were Hyperborean farm boys. Since I had just read Louis L'Amour's autobiography, I was digging through his other works, and Shane recommended one title in particular called Last of the Breed. It's the kind of story that you'd expect was made into a blockbuster movie at some point, but it probably wouldn't be adapted these days for a host of reasons. Allow me to explain. The story takes place in Siberia in the mid-1980s when the USA and USSR were in the final throes of the Cold War. Our hero is an Air Force pilot named Joseph Makatozi, who goes by Joe Mack for short. He's a test pilot working on experimental aircraft, stationed out of Alaska, and during one of his test flights, his plane malfunctions, forcing him to land in enemy territory. There, he's captured by the Soviets, who think they can flip him against America. You see, Joe Mack has Native American heritage, and the simple-minded Soviet commander Zamatev thinks it's as simple as telling the Indian boy that he can get back at the big bad white man by helping Mother Russia. Joe flips Zamatev the metaphorical bird and says, I don't care about that, I'm American, oh, and by the way, I'm going to escape this place. That may seem a tall order given that this place is a fenced-in prison in the middle of freaking nowhere, which describes most of Siberia, but Joe is not easily daunted. He pole vaults over the fence and makes a run for it, kicking off what will become a year-long game of cat and mouse between him and his would-be captors. Joe's plan? Hike overland to the Bering Strait, build a canoe, and cross to Alaska where he can return to his commanders. Zamatev's plan? Hire a Yakut, the Russian version of a Native American, to track Joe and bring him back. Joe ends up using all of the skills he learned from his Sioux family members growing up, like tracking, evading, hunting, fishing, and trapping animals. He passes through the occasional small town, finds work to support himself here and there, and even makes the odd friend or two. Despite numerous run-ins with Soviet authorities, he is able to stay free and evade his captors, even going so far as to shoot down an enemy helicopter with a bow and arrow. Lamore writes the scene incredibly well and makes it feel very plausible. Now, a story like this tends to keep you reading because you want to know if Joe succeeds, but for me what kept the pages turning was seeing how Joe got out of each scrape. The experience was improved by my knowledge of Lamore's writing methods, his devotion to detail and facts, and his desire to tell exciting stories that could really happen, instead of inventing things out of whole cloth. This is a man who traveled the world, worked dozens of odd jobs as a hobo in the 1930s, fought in World War II, and met people from hundreds of cultures, learning what he could from anyone and everyone who would talk to him. His belief in the superiority of truth over fiction was why I kept reading, burning the midnight oil as Joe crossed the Siberian wilderness. In movies, we're treated to characters who can take five gunshots and stay upright, all while dropping quotable lines and shrugging off damage that would reduce any real human being to a bleeding mess. Joe Mack is a much more grounded protagonist, though, a guy who's up against staggering odds, but has a unique skill set due to his heritage and upbringing that can help him see it through. More than that, he has the kind of attitude that we'd all do well to emulate, a rugged determination to adapt and endure despite the daunting task before him. At one point in the story, he makes friends with a woman and entrusts her with his true identity, telling her about his plan to cross the Bering Strait in a freaking homemade canoe. She's doubtful he'll succeed, saying that doesn't sound like it will be very easy. Joe's reply is the sort of thing you'd find on a vinyl lettering website for inspiring home decor. 
I didn't say it would be easy. I said I would do it. That's the kind of quotable champion stuff that got me through a lot of difficult mud runs. I mentioned that this book wouldn't get adapted to the big screen today, and there are a few reasons for that. It would have to be a period piece, for one, and Hollywood tends to make Cold War stories into tense spy thrillers instead of rugged survival flicks. The muddy, in-the-trenches stuff is saved for World War stories or Vietnam pieces. But the bigger issue is twofold. First, Joe is unapologetically American and believes in the righteous superiority of the free USA over the collectivist USSR, which is not a message that Hollywood likes to sell these days. Second, Joe has a chance to give in to Indian grievances against white people and outright refuses to do so. In the current climate of critical race analysis and grudge amplification, the story just wouldn't be told that way. Hollywood cares more about narratives outside of the theater than they care about good stories within one. As cool as it would be to see a Last of the Breed movie, I'm fine with Hollywood keeping its grubby hands off of a classic. Books are an awesome medium on their own, and it's a rare thing for a story to be improved by a screen adaptation. Looking at you, Stardust. So give your own summer reading list a big, beefy shot in the arm with Louis L'Amour's Last of the Breed, and let me know what you think. Get back to your reading.